Welcome back. Season 4, Episode 5 of Comic Book Nation. Your one-stop shop for all things geek culture. We're the only show out here doing what we do. So, we're back, and this week we got a board of good stuff to talk about. My co-host, Matthew Aguilar, is what with up? me. Janelle Yay. Wheeler is with me. Hey, everybody. Matt's back. Let's go. Matt's back. Oh, yeah, <laughs> that's right. We I wasn't road. here last week. Yeah, it feels yeah. so long ago. No. <laughs> it's, I mean, Milestone, you were out, but you were doing fun stuff for the company. You were out. You were doing all kinds of things, Royal Rumble. Uh, Talking wrestling, to wrestlers. Wrestling. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that and do a recap uh, later on about you know what went down, what Matt saw, and kind of a little recap on our Royal Rumble preview from last week. But before all that, the first thing we're going to get into, we got a whole TV rundown. We're going to talk about some Marvel casting and a whole and some crazy TV that's just, you know, airing right now. But first things first, we got to get back to the Star Wars discussion. You guys know we've been doing uh, the Book of Boba Fett here ever since it started streaming on Disney+. Plus. And uh, man, what a wild ride this show has turned out to be. Um, so last week we had a whole debate. I mean, we've been having debates about like whether this show is hitting the mark, whether it's not hitting the mark. Uh, last week we did a whole show about how they did the Mandalorian episode and how crazy that was. And, you know, we got into a whole thing about that. And then this week, you know, I defended <laughs> Book of Boba Fett. I went real in about how, you know, the Mandalorian episode was a good detour because it was all this thematic stuff and all this big stuff. And then we get to this week. So Mandalorian, Chapter 6 from the Desert, A Stranger Comes, strange title for an episode that's essentially like a, a Baby Yoda episode, right? For Baby most of Yoda. It. Uh, Grogu, I think we finally crossed the border to calling him Grogu, so I'm just gonna go with Grogu from here on out. But, um, yeah, we still we got oh, my goodness, uh, so we got this kind of Grogu episode to catch us up with the other half of the Mandalorian series, which is where Grogu is. And we got a Luke Skywalker return with a new body actor and some crazy, Who cares? Questionable no one cares, faces. no one cares about that. Grogu is is here and to say, I cared about it. Day, and no one cares about Luke Skywalker. <laughs> you, you're out of your mind. First of no all, no one cares about Luke Skywalker. First I got of all, so take it down him, a notch. Oh, I mean, yeah, his parenting is questionable. Like, yeah, his whole <laughs> leadership is now knowing what we all know, what comes. It's like, dude, you're so wrong in this. Well, Just I mean, let him see him. To be fair, so Homeboy bad. was out there. To be fair, Homeboy has been out there all by himself. Like, I mean, he's had to train himself, really. So, like. I mean, yeah, but we're, we're never, that's neither here nor there. You're making my set fall apart already. <laughs> it's already coming down. I caused getting chaos. Getting I caused yeah, chaos. Getting, heated, I getting me heated over here. Um, yeah, Matt, you're coming in hot. But uh, <laughs> this was a crazy, this episode was done by Dave Filoni, who is the guru of the Star Wars animated universe. And man, aside from, I mean, and this was kind of a perfect it's weird because I can't decide still if this episode was kind of this like weird, uneven kind of movement that we had or just this kind of weird balance of giving things to the mainstream fans that they love, plus all these really deep cuts into kind of Star Wars comics and mostly the animated side because we had all these things happen. Ahsoka Tano met Luke Skywalker for the first time. And like if you're a hardcore Star Wars like geek like me, or uh, Richard in the background back there, like, you know what that <laughs> meant, that, you know, Anakin's former apprentice kind of sat down and finally had this scene with Luke. And we had, you know, spoilers, because, oh, man, did oh I catch God, it. Oh, my God, dude. Did I catch it? it? If anybody's worried about what comic book, you know, I plan the comic book Star Wars content. So if you're mad about comic book and the spoilers this week, you can yell at me. Don't worry. The company <laughs> yelled at me plenty. So like everybody, what? the internet yelled at me. The companies yelled at me. Like what? everybody yelled at me because. Why? Of the, oh, because of this next pick that I can't spoil Janelle without a huge spoiler warning. So spoiler, what? spoiler, spoilers for chapter six of Boba spoilers. Fett. Oh, we got it in writing. It's under the show. There it is. If you're watching and if you're listening, just spoilers. <laughs> spoiler alert coming. I should have never stopped. <laughs> Doing that. Um, yeah, so Dave Filoni finally got to bring uh, his boy Cad Bane yes! into live action. And I guess Cad Bane has a lot of love because, you know, I put in a couple articles that ran in the morning that had the word Cad Bane in them. And man, the hate mail has never stopped coming. Uh, I feel like Matt and the Wonder Woman incident now. Like, you know, except nobody knows my name and where to find me. But 
<laughs> so, <laughs> that's how you do this like a Jedi oh master God, or a Sith is. Lord. I'm not sure which, but anyway. So Cad Bane got moved into live action and uh, he looks dope. He looked dope. Yeah, because okay. uh, I always mispronounce the, the, the species that come from Dueros or whatever they're called. Yeah, they've they've been to Star Wars once and it didn't look so good because it was in the original trilogy and it was just a guy in like a weird prosthetic suit. So he looked badass. Um, and he came and did his gunslinger thing, old west style. I mean, we had our boy Cobb Vanth. Like this episode just was like uh, scene by scene by moment by moment awesome. by moment. The, just, the like, word everybody, you're looking for yeah. is awesome. <laughs> I didn't I did not hate it. It just made me I just felt weird putting myself out there with the whole Mandalorian detour thing, and then we got this episode, and I was like, man. These people are going to be coming for me. And some of them did come for me. But um, that's neither here nor there. But uh, it was funny because this episode actually had Boba Fett cameo in his own show, which was hilarious uh, to me. He was just in one like little random cameo scene with Mando. Um, but uh, I'm not mad because I get what this is. Like the book of Boba Fett, if you guys aren't, if we're not teeing in, let's have the real discussion, is, I mean, a title is might have misled fans. But it when you call something like a book, it, it, it goes back to like biblical stuff, right? And a book is just like a whole story around which centers this one person, but it's always about this larger story about what, you know, the parable is, right? Yeah. And so the parable about of this one is the story of how all these kind of tribeless people who have been alone for a long time all kind of discover this you know, desire to be part of a tribe, right? And how they all start to come together because that's what all these characters have in common if you haven't placed it together. Boba Fett, Fennec Shan, Black Kersantin, Mando, Grogu, um, and if you want to mention the Speed Bike Kids too. Uh, they all are these people who have had not had like a real family or tribe or, and now they're building this idea. And that's what unites them. So in the sense that this is a book, like a Bible book, this is a parable about tribeless people finding meaning and heart in becoming together as a tribe. Um, and, and it's consistent. Like that's why Boba Fett has this whole little conversation with Black Crescent and says, stop working for people who are just going to use you. Like your life should be more than something. And it's this kind of spreading idea. It started with Fennec. And then we saw the background of why Fennec started to believe in him and like, you know, the whole journey. So, well, I get brings it. Up a really, I mean, that's a really good point that Norn is red brings up. Like Boba is doing for them what the Tuscans exactly did for him. Did for and, him. And oh, that okay. goes to you can't have that payoff unless you have all the episodes that dip into what happened with him and the Tuscans. Like now, do yeah. I feel like there are ways to like trim some of that? That like you know what I mean? And get to the point quicker. Sure. I, I'm not saying the show's flawless, but at the same time. Like we we once we knew what the point was, which was hey, this group is gonna go against Boba and and his side, and it's gonna be this territory thing, and it's gonna be this kind of battle that way. Then it's assembling the team, and that stuff's fun, you know. But like we know what the point is now. Yeah. So, I mean, the fact that like some are calling it like Mandalorian two point five or whatever, like okay, got you know that's cool. Like they if, also if said that. I mean. To be fair, if you go back to the interviews, they told us also in the yeah. beginning that this would also be Mandalorian 2.5. They told us that. So, I mean, either thing. But I just don't want to pretend like there isn't. I mean, I, I love, you know, I got into this. I had to stop because Jim Viscardi claimed to be one of these people. But I said there was a type of person that I kept seeing make these jerks on, on Twitter. Oh, it was the book of Mando and stuff like that. So it, it is kind of funny to see. I'm there, one of those people, too. I said the book of Grogu is so good this week. Yeah, Chanel Wheeler. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, here's the thing. It's been the book of Boba, though, for like how many episodes and everyone, like a lot of people, including me, at certain points along the way have been like, it's kind of, it's there's, there's boring parts to this show sometimes. Like, it's like, man, it's slow paced. Like, it needs a little bit of something else. So then we get that, which I'm very happy about. And then people complain about that too. Like there yeah, was a no. part of this that like you can't please everybody, so who cares? You know, so just like yeah. you write the show you want to write. But like that, this is what I I wanted was like a little of some of that fun magic stuff and bring some of that in, bring some of those characters in. But we still don't lose the plot as long as it gets as long as next episode brings that all in in a satisfying way, and we the get the payoff that we're building thing, to. Yeah. yeah, I'm good, man. Like I'm I'm good. 
And there's uh, still more kind of, and this may just be the beginning of something. Like people, I, we've done a lot of deep cut things about, because we do a lot with Star Wars comics, and there's been a lot that's building in there with Boba Fett that suggests this is just the beginning of something. And who's behind the Pike Syndicate and what's really going on here? And like, there's a lot of stuff happening. And we're going to get to that because we're going to talk Star Wars comics this week. But uh, I think we all see like, you know, uh, like where would that we see the value in the book of Boba Fett? Like, I don't think this is a failed experiment. Yes, there are some things that could have maybe been trimmed or done differently in the execution. Maybe it hasn't been as strong as Mando, but it has been one person as opposed for a lot of that beginning part, as opposed to just like many directors pushing their hands in but i'm not going to defend you feel how you feel about it but uh, i'm excited for the finale who isn't this show is a big trending topic right now and it's taken over thing um you know neck and neck there with a uh, peacemaker which we're also going to discuss but uh yeah i think we're good on the book of boba fett and matt got his grogu episode so i'm happy for he's it. got his little humpy's arm yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's so cute uh, you're gonna have that i, I mean I'm i hope so he picks happy. it yeah, I mean, Grogu, I hope, I mean, what do you guys want Grogu to pick? I mean, because I, I did an article on this. It's on comicbook.com, Star Wars, about, you know, which way should he go. Um, the franchise could make it easy on itself by just saying he goes Jedi. He disappears. He's gone. You know, he's been off training. That's why he hasn't been around and, you know, fully grown go or, you know, because they age slower. But, like, moderately grown go Grogu shows up after and starts running around with Rey, right? Like, after mm -hmm. Rise of Skywalker, you can pull that move, right? Um, or you keep the Mandalorian money train going and you're like, nah, he puts on the chain mail and, you know, he starts throwing in with Mando again and they got to go save Mandalore, which makes the Mandalorian season three a must watch. Right. So what do you guys want to do? Uh oh, <laughs> he says he knew. <laughs> oh, Brywood. Brywood says if the Jedi had those vests, maybe they would have survived Order 66. Ooh, terrible. Facts. Ooh. Facts, though. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had that Janet ja I wish I had a bag of chips. I could do that Janet Jackson meme. All right. Yeah, do be facts, though. All right. But uh, what do you want him to choose? Um, I would like to see how Mando does without Grogu personally. So I would like the next season of the show to dip into all the Mandalorian stuff and maybe leave Mando behind and uh, see how he does. See if you're making those Boba Fett comments when you take away the little plush doll for a little bit, Mando fans. And I would love to see Grogu reemerge as like a, an actual badass Jedi and, you know, running around and doing all that. I think the payoff later would be worthwhile, but that's an investment. That's me. Uh, Matt, your faces during <laughs> that told me what you're going to choose. So just go ahead and say it. No, no, no. Yeah, best. Go I'm ahead. Gonna, I'm going to choose Grogu because I think he can be both. And I agree, by the way. I saw, I can't remember who said it in the comments, but I, but I saw, I, I feel like he does need both, but mm -hmm. he needs both Luke and Mando in his life. But I feel like right now, you know, Luke has already been teaching him some things. He's already been doing that. There's no re like what frustrated me about the episode is like Luke's whole thing of like it's the Jedi way. And knowing what we know now, the Jedi way doesn't always freaking work. It's been, like you're the same dude who's like sequestered on an island later. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like the, I knowing that it's just so frustrating seeing like hearing it come out of his mouth and be like this traditionalist thing. And it's like just change stuff. You know, it's okay to like adjust things to the individual it's okay to take things on a case-by-case -case basis the same thing that worked for 80 other people doesn't mean it will work for this one so i think you can still have a little badass grogu jedi in that form but still have that relationship that is growing between mando and him because that to me is part of what makes mandalorian work yes it's cool wild west stuff but the the whole like cub aspect of that is like why that show is part of why that show is an important part of why that show took off like it did i mean yeah i mean in an ideal world we do want him to get rid of both, both. people Just have been both. saying people are saying it's only the sith deal and absolutes all that stuff which doesn't look good for luke you know mm -hmm. sorry luke but um yeah we we could have both and have them go i mean we want to see luke join grogu and come crashing in and help save you know every avengers team needs it's like it needs it's thor and hulk right so also i already <laughs> have hulk. like three grogu plushies cunning linguists so i would just like to throw that out there <laughs> i already so have a couple <laughs> and yes to answer some comment questions yes the school that the little ant droids are building in this episode is the same jedi school that basically 
um, shows up in Star Wars comics where Kylo Ren is, or Ben Solo is trained, freaks out, and he destroys, you know, it gets destroyed when he freaks out and has that falling out with Luke and, you know, all that stuff happens. So that is the same Jedi school. So that's another comic book kind of Easter egg deep cut that we saw in that episode. But um, all right. So that's Book of Boba Fett. <laughs> I think we've we've done this to death. We're gonna see what this finale does. Oh my gosh, Matt, you are such a super fan. This is so cute. <laughs> Happy so, Valentine's Day, son. That's so cute. Oh my god, you are crazy. I mean, his heart, Grogu's heart is not in the training. I don't think. I think that was pretty clear in this episode. Like even Luke's like, oh my God. Yeah, something's something's amiss here. So Luke we'll has see. too many judgments in his heart. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move on to something else that uh, is going down uh, that made some uh, big stirs on the social medias, oh and that God. is the casting of Dakota Johnson, Fifty Shades of Grey star Dakota Johnson, who has been cast in the Madam Web spinoff film, the Spider-Man spinoff. Remember, I don't even remember what season were we still in the studio when we first started talking about Madam oh, Web. God. Mm. I don't think were so. We? No, I think no. we were we were already in the Zoom era. We were in the Zoom era. We were just kind of like, wait, what? <laughs> yeah. So Madam Web is getting cast, and uh, it's going to be Dakota Johnson from Fifty Shades of Grey. So there you go. There's your Madam Web. Uh, wait, okay. it's been like announced, or is she a possible candidate? Uh, no, it's been announced that. You oh, it's know, actually. I thought yeah. it was like a possibility. So and it's like we have to just first live woman, with this. Yeah, the first <laughs> woman to headline a Spider-Man movie. Um, by all indications, this is still separate from all I all I know is that this is still separate from Olivia Wilde's Spider Project that she's well, doing with Marvel. Yes, but it would can I imagine it, if they go with the some of the origin story it'll connect like that's the reading like looking at this is probably how we'll get to spider woman spider verse live action characters and all that like this yeah. is the entryway because you know like she is the grandmother of a spider woman not jessica drew but you can rewrite that right yeah <laughs> like you can you can redo that and have jessica drew in there and then you connect olivia's and then you spear that off into something else right she is very much a like this this character and that's why we talked about it, it was so weird that they picked this character but you can also see why do we have frozen matt is this frozen matt oh, yes. crap. Is it frozen matt? oh they're all now we have a hand. i caught it i caught it dang it oh, i wanted to see um, frozen matt <laughs> yeah, no, uh, it's it's a weird it's a weird pick. I honestly didn't wouldn't wasn't gonna believe it until they actually started casting that this movie was gonna happen. Yeah, so, I, I guess it's I, happening now. Yeah, I mean I, this I mean this feels like she'll be the like the uh, nexus of a whole Spider Verse, right? Like this will be yeah. kind of yeah. So all right, oh, so yeah, there good you point, go, Damon Streams. Yeah, Silk too. So it's yeah. another one. Like every you can get to everybody pretty much from this movie if you do it right. So like yeah, there's a whole female Spider Verse popping I'm up. I'm not. Right I'm. I'm just gonna say it. I don't. I don't. I'm not a big fan of any of this. I'm not a big fan of this. Nobody is character. Yet. I'm not a big fan of her. Like I didn't even like her in Fifty Shades of Grey. I just feel like it's. I. I don't understand. I'm so I, confused. I'm I haven't. So disappointed. I, I haven't. I mean, I wasn't a fan of Fifty Shades of Grey. Period. But like, I, I thought she was in the Lost Daughter this year with Olivia Coleman. And she was like unrecognizable in that movie for much of it. And I was like, wait, why do I feel like I know who this mm -hmm. actress is? And then I looked it up and I was like, holy guacamole. Like, yeah, it. Um, she's really good in that because she plays like a, she's part of this kind of like Greek gang family that this lady encounters on vacation. And she's kind of like a strained mother. And she was really good in that. So, I mean, I, I think she can do really good stuff. You guys if you give clarify her good this stuff. character for me though, Madam Webb, like how, how, what is her age range? Cause I'm very thrown off by that too. So in the book, she is, it kind of depends on what time frame you're talking about, but like okay. essentially the, the easiest way to sum it up is at some point she's kind of considered a mortal. Okay? okay. But she is depicted often as like an older character. So like someone in like there. Like an Agatha? Yeah, it's like someone in That's that, exactly what I was thinking. that age range, right? So <laughs> that is how she's typically depicted in the comics. Um, now, granted, that doesn't mean I'm all for like changing things up as far as, you know, but what I guess 
for me, I was a little um, surprised that like Dakota, who is very young, <laughs> um, was like, oh yeah, like, I don't know. Like I'm always kind of like, I like what they did with um, like Marissa Tomei, seeing, seeing the pattern that they did with like Marissa Tomei as right. Aunt May. I was kind of, you know, looking for something like that, like or Catherine you know, bring, Hahn, bring in somebody, like, yeah. or yeah, or bring in someone like that. a little younger, but not like a very young, like vibrant, right? Because like, this, like this person, Spider Gwen, or something, yeah, like this person is supposed to be someone who she's very much like a mentor character. She's always given yeah. like vague things. She's very much like a living fortune cookie. You know, it's it's kind of like you go this way and the world will die or whatever. It's that kind of stuff, right? Because she can, she's like clairvoyant, so. But like Dakota Johnson didn't like immediately pop up in my mind when I thought nobody this, this character, Bro, right? Let's yeah. be honest, nobody knows what to expect from this character. Did Sony owe her a favor or something? Yeah, probably. <laughs> like she like, no, I want to be a superhero, sorry. make it happen somehow. Yeah, but like, if they no, superhero, for... okay, we can do that. <laughs> well, and um, there's also, of course, the whole thing of like, you know, like maybe they want one, yes, this would likely be an origin thing, right? Yeah, but I don't. To, I'm not. I'm not buying it. I don't know really? if this is just going to be a Madam Web movie. I don't buy it. I think Madam. No, Web, no. As far as like yeah. her, the Dakota's version of the character would be like someone like oh, you yeah, actually yeah. get to see. Okay, like her grow into that character, and like you said, I haven't seen that movie um, that she was in where she kind of looked unrecognizable. You know, they can. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. like these things, <laughs> makeup and prosthetics exist, right? So like, it can do stuff to age her up if they needed to like if a certain thing of events happen um I mean, but i don't know back luke so <laughs> i mean right you know so they can do anything pretty much uh but it is an odd it is an odd choice but it but here's the thing my bottom line is if this is what i need to get to spider woman movie then okay <laughs> i just feel like i very rarely ever feel negative on something and this one is just this is the first one that hit me in the face like i just don't know i i just i'm not excited about it at all and that has not happened to me like since I started on the podcast. Man, <laughs> yeah. that's all good. I don't think you need to be. Yeah, um, it's this in X Men books. Oh yeah. yeah. All right. Wow. All right. What? So What's that's a good place. Mean? That's a good place where we're just going to take a break and knock out our break real quick. But when we come back, we got to talk about Peacemaker. We got to talk about the new series, Pam and Tommy and Sebastian Stan and his Winter Soldier. Oh we got to talk about some things in wrestling and gaming. And uh, we have an interview with Star Wars, the High Republic writer, Daniel Jose Older, coming up as well. So stay tuned after this ad break. Got me. Got you this time? Yeah. It got me, yeah. Yeah, our music always scares you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, but that's how we get people back alert and back on the stream. All right. And I'm sorry if you're listening to this audio. We apologize for your eardrums. <laughs> All right, back to Comic Book Nation. So we just talked about the Book of Boba, Boba, Book, yeah, the Book of Boba Fett, the bewildering Madam Web casting. So let's talk about Peacemaker this week. Um, still loving this show. Loving this show. Uh yeah, this was the whole thing with Mern and the whole kind of butterfly episode and a great sequence, like the great action sequence of Peacemaker and Vigilante getting kind of stormed by the cops and that thing, you know, a lot of development. This is getting us set up for the finale and the big kind of fights in the, in the penultimate and last episode. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, I'm really loving Peacemaker. And this one was great. This was James Gunn didn't to do his full on horror thing. Because if you know anything about James Gunn, like creature horror movies are kind of like where he really began to break out. And then kind of violent, weird superhero movies. It was Slither and then Super, which were his two breakout films, which is, yeah, again, creepy monster horror. And then kind of deranged superhero movie. Uh, and so these things came together in perfect synthesis this week for Peacemaker as the butterfly invasion happened around town and also Peacemaker had to do some demented stuff with Vigilante. Uh, and like I said, loving this show, James Gunn really does make something that's quite unlike anybody else. He is like, I don't like to use the word auteur. It sounds stupid and snobby, but uh, sometimes it fits and he really is an auteur and yeah, we, superhero TV has benefited from this show, and yeah, I mean that's my spiel. I don't have, I can't go too deep. I just love Peacemaker. It's a great time. Like, what else is there to say for me? Uh, how about you guys? This was just epic. Uh, it is feeling more and more like a movie. Like, I uh, there are some shows that I feel have like fallen a little like to the side as far as you know, like Falcon Winter Soldier for me, I was kind of like, oh, it's a TV show. It feels like a TV show. It's a TV show. Peacemaker is like a long movie. Like it's action packed. I love like everything that they're doing, the reveals and keeping you confused about certain things on purpose. Obviously they're keeping you engaged. Like it just, it's, I'm even interested in his dad's story. I am, there's so many like other things to focus on and other storylines that I'm just pumped about. I, I just, I'm loving the show. It's intense. <laughs> like I have to watch like, and just like that afterwards. <laughs> I do. I, I really do. But it is, it is so action packed and like satisfying on such a deep level, like seeing the blood and gore on top of just like the humor and the, the dark, you know, James Gunness of it. It's, it's fun to see him doing this and not having to too, like do too much like Guardians, like happy go lucky. It's like edgy James Gunn. Oh my god, love it. Yeah, gotta love when DC puts them to good use, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Brian would yeah. make a good point though. It's gonna be fun uh, once Vigilante has like a whole army of people that he can cut loose on. I, I can't wait to see what happens with that. Oh my gosh, him doing yeah. all those backflips and stuff <laughs> in the opening credit sequence like makes me think, you know. There's got to be a great action sequence coming up for that. Matt, you got any uh, close us out on Vigilante? Because we're going to keep it moving. I mean, I'm going Vigilante on Peacemaker. Because <laughs> <keep it moving. laughs> um, No, I mean, I look, I've not been as high on this show as as others. Um, I, I, I like I've come around on the last two episodes. The last two episodes, I've enjoyed it um, more than than the previous um, bunch. I, I don't. This is one of those, man. I, I don't know what it is. It's just not clicking all the way for me like i i don't i don't seek out like when boba hits i'm excited to like watch boba and like i want to watch boba i watch peacemaker because like i feel like i should watch peacemaker and then i enjoy parts about it and i come up with the last two episodes especially actually though not this one the one before was the, probably my favorite episode of the season um but you know outside of this i, I don't know like it's not clicking all the way for me but i enjoy it i like it Matt, slightly dead inside. Noted. <laughs> I, mean, I, just, I, I don't know what it is, man. Matt just, just lives for the cute. Me, Come man. on. We it's know. Just, it doesn't, doesn't click for me. If you give Matt Grogu on the same Matt. week as the moths entering human bodies, he's going for Grogu. <laughs> Matt, Peacemaker gave you eagerly an eagle yeah, holding I know. it down. I, this show should, one, okay, number one, this show has the best <laughs> intro of any show. <laughs> There's so much to love about the show, but it's just in moments. Like, I wouldn't. This is not like, let's put it this way. There are shows that I will go back and watch just because like I love those moments and I love those episodes. Mm -hmm. I will not go back and watch Peacemaker. Like it's, I'm I'm done and then I'm done. Like I'm going to move on. Like there's episodes of The Mandalorian I will go back and watch. Even like the ones that aren't necessarily just like all Grogu all the time. Like I'll watch those. Loki, like Hawkeye, I will watch all certain right. episodes. I just, the show's just not. We're not peeling back your layers. We're going to keep moving. I didn't say it was bad, by the no. way. I didn't. <laughs> I just said I don't love We had a whole vibe going there for a second. Oh, All right. Uh, so let's turn to something right. else. So Peacemakers out there, you guys know. Um, so this week, man, Falcon and Winter Soldier star Sebastian Stan takes on a <laughs> whole different kind of role this week with the launch of uh, Pam and Tommy on Hulu, which is kind of based on 
the breakdown of the uh, Pam Anderson and Tommy Lee sex tape in the 90s. And we've been doing a lot of this lately. There's been this kind of like whole wave in entertainment, whether it's docu-series or these kind of dramatic series of kind of looking back at the things that happened in the 90s and, and like all the big scandals that we all knew from like high school or middle school, depending on where you fall in all this. But uh, for me, it was like high school. Um, and yeah, like all those tape scandals and kind of going back over that. And it is kind of interesting to think about, you know, where we are now in society and, and how we all were back then. And this one is by Craig Gillespie, the guy who did I, Tanya. Um, it stars Seth Rogen, Nick Offerman, and of course, Sebastian Stan as Tommy Lee and Lily Rab from uh, Baby Driver as T Pamela Anderson. And Man, this this show is is hardcore as pretty much it can get. I was like, is it? I was like, how can I be doing this on TV? But uh, oh, and Jason Manzukis has a nice cameo role in the show as well. But uh, we'll get to all that. Um, it it, it is a slow start because it, it's about how the person who kind of stole the sex tape and for Tam Tommy Lee and Pam Anderson, what the backstory of all that was. That's Rogan's character and kind of how he acquired it. and how the releasing this kind of ushered in a new age because the, it was because they figured out that they could do it on the internet, which was, was the whole difference here. Like none of the traditional, you know, adult outlets would take it because it was an illegal stolen tape, but the internet offered this whole new wild west and kicked off this whole new kind of era of both what the darker side of the internet and what it offered and our, our new age of kind of like what celebrity meant. Right. So it is an interesting series in that respect, but taking all that intellectualism and putting it aside, you know, there are some highlights like Tommy Lee's uh, famous member ha is a <laughs> character and Jason Manzoukas voices it. And there are segments of, it, of you watching it talk to Tommy Lee and things like that. And so this show, uh, jarring. And, yes, jarring because I, Charlie Ripley, Charlie Ridley knows, like, because I did not read anything. I mean, I just knew the premise. I knew who starred in it and all that. So when I got to these sections, I was not ready for this. But uh, if you've seen Craig Gillespie's work, you shouldn't be surprised. Um, the man is a darkly comic kind of part Artur, kind of kind of part wild, zany, crazy person about Americana stuff. And that's his fascination is the kind of wild, savage absurdity of Americana life and 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 you know the famous things we've gone through and scandals and all that so yeah there's a, there's a talking member and it yeah it, it's crazy the only reason we're talking about this here is because it's sebastian stan and i just wanted to imagine all the marvel fans who and sebastian stanners who mm -hmm. kind of jumped into this <laughs> you know, based on the allure of what it, of how much you get to see. Cause the dude's like half naked. I mean, pretty much naked most of the time in the show. Mm -hmm. Cause it's Tommy Lee. So he's like, you know, there are no shirts really. Swapping uh, around. Yeah. And just kind of walking around the G string. So I, said I just swapping, thought it was hilarious. Sure. Swapping, yeah. <laughs> you, yeah it, it was just. It was just, it was, I just had to just imagine and are, laugh like, all the, ma the Marvel fans who probably jumped into this. And just I'm not having a hard time like thinking of him as Tommy, like he does such a great job. I'm really impressed with his performance because not once have I been like, Oh, that's Bucky. Like the whole time, like it is, it's Tom. No, he like, nails it, Tommy Lee. Like, yeah, golly. It's, it's pretty good. Crazy. It's pretty good. Um, it's, it's kind of addictive. It's like a guilty pleasure kind of thing. And you're really, really rooting for someone that you don't think you're going to root for. Now, uh, to answer some questions in the comments, no, um, we haven't seen Moonfall. You, uh, I, I love movies, but yeah, uh, yeah, um, no, <laughs> uh, I'm not. I'm not going out for that, guys. Like, I love you guys. I love you guys a lot, but I'm not going out for that. Brandon Davis, I think, has seen that, or somebody, or Chris. Go talk to Brandon and Chris. They're on Twitter. They're all. Oh, I did. Uh, I did see a comment about uh, Reacher. Reacher. Uh, yeah, Reacher is excellent by the yeah. way is it we're gonna good. get in yeah there you go matt yeah do a uh, thing on reacher we're here we're talking tv go ahead oh well that, well we've got an interview with uh alan richson uh and lee child uh going up on the site soon um and uh got to sit down with them and talk about the season but oh you, uh, you got the inside track say something man <laughs> well no <laughs> it wasn't in the layout i'm not gonna just shove stuff the in. Layout. uh no <laughs> i didn't think about honestly, okay so anyway it, it's very good i mean Have you learned uh, nothing from branding davis you better drop you better drop <laughs> these names you better uh, talk about who you talk <laughs> to no no uh alan uh man that that character like you talk about people just like embodying a character 
um, as was in the books. And yes, like he's a, you know, Alan is a very like, like sharp looking guy. And in the books, they always describe Reacher as like, you know, he's got scars and he's got like, you know, he's and but they also cast Tom Cruise in the movies, right? So <laughs> they, they cast like pretty people in this role that's like this rugged person. But everything else, like just the way he carries himself and the way he like talks to people, I, I feel like people are going to come away with this and be like, this is, I think this could be his kind of, he's had big roles before. And he's had breaks, but like this is a really great feature vehicle for him. Uh, and the action's great. There are some awesome, brutal action scenes uh, in this, and it's it's genuinely funny. And it's just very much like the books, right? It's just like small town. Reacher just moves through places as he goes, and it's just kind of the slice of life thing because uh, he's interacting with all these different people each series. So you know, hoping that we get a season two because season one is really good. So, all right, where can people watch it? Uh, you can watch it on Amazon, Amazon Prime, baby. All right. And Charlie so, Ridgely should have the full review up uh, on the site. All right, I'll cool. be watching that and Moonfall. Uh, so. Matt, uh, give us a quick wrestling gaming just update because we got to get to comics and we got to get to an interview. So we got a lot. Yeah, to yeah, do. yeah. We got a lot to get to. Um, yeah. So just a quick recap. Uh, lots, of, lots of people buying stuff uh, in the gaming industry. <laughs> uh, Microsoft yes. uh, purchased Activision Blizzard uh, for $68.7 billion. Um, the, the biggest thing to, to note from this is that one, all the franchises that Microsoft just got access to, which is like, just to give you an idea, right? It's like the Call of Duty franchise, Warcraft, Candy Crush, <laughs> Tony Hawk, Diablo, Overwatch, Crash Bandicoot. They've been taking our PlayStation comments real personal. And, and the big thing is the studios actually, because a lot of Activision has been doing this hoarding thing of like all the studios they've kind of had make games for them and then acquired. Then they've turned them like a year or two later, they've turned them into Call of Duty support studios so like Raven Software, who everyone knows from like Ultimate, you know, like Ultimate Alliance and like those games. Right. Um, like they've had to make Call of Duty stuff for the last couple of years. Toys for Bob has been a uh, Call of Duty studio, like all these things. So everyone's kind of hoping that Microsoft gets to kind of let them actually do what they want to do if they don't necessarily just want to be a Call of Duty machine and do stuff. Um, the other big thing to take away from this is that from reports, you know, Phil Spencer has said uh, that, you know, they're going to honor contracts that are already in place with other platforms and things like that. But according to reports, that really pertains to like three Call of Duty games because those were already in contracts or promised to PlayStation. So like the next Call of Duty um, that will come out, uh, I've got it written down here. All right, so hold on. Infinity Wards, Call of Duty, Treyarch's 2023 Call of Duty, and then Warzone 2 are essentially the ones that are like, those will be the ones that are probably still multi-platform even after the purchase. After that, who knows? You know, you might see an exclusive thing and then maybe just Warzone stays multi-platform, but then all the other stuff is Microsoft only, right? So um, following the Bethesda deal, like we're going to see exclusives. This is going to be so interesting. Yeah. This is a very well, interesting time. In you know, especially since Sony then went and now this this was not reactionary. Obviously, because people think stuff happens in a bubble. This is not reactionary. This stuff is happening. Companies aren't this petty, guys. Yeah, Sony is, but this is the first because Sony has said like they are acquiring multiple studios. So uh, Sony acquired Bungie. Now this was nowhere near. This was three point six billion, and ironically, one point two billion of it was actually just to keep. Because part of the reason they want Bungie is obviously these are you know the Destiny two developers, and Destiny two is a big money driver. And a, and a popular game, but also uh, their experience with live service games is like unheralded, right? And so Sony wants to do more live service games over the next few years. So who better than to get them to help them with this? So they spent like 1.2 of that is actually just retention so that the developers didn't just like all bail and go start their own studios. So like they put a lot of money into like trying to keep the talent that is already at Bungie. So that's that's interesting. I guess the biggest question comes from like, you know, if there's more acquisitions on the way, like who does like who is out there that's just like ripe for like Sony to just to acquire and swallow that. As long as it's not Nintendo, we're good. <laughs> yeah, Nintendo no, Nintendo, oh, no, right? Nintendo's chilling. They're like, I know, Yo, I know. you guys argue with software, come get in this hardware game. We move in units. Yep. 
We I outside. Love it. I yeah. love it. Yeah. Nintendo's um, moving crazy units if you haven't seen. Like, yeah. Oh, no. They, they have no. million. million. I'm so yeah, proud of my culture. Nintendo. Let's they go. No it's insane. They have so, no yeah. issues. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it's interesting question. that hardware. Like, they are. Getting yeah. Hardware. So let us know on the uh, Comic Book Nation uh, account, you know, who you would, uh, who else you would like to see uh, join Sony. The other, only other thing is uh, one of the big releases this week is Dying Light 2, uh, which you can check out my full review uh on the site uh, this was a game that i was not like i wouldn't say is like exactly in my wheelhouse you know what i mean it's like zombie apocalypse it's first person <laughs> it's like parkour i don't know that doesn't scream me but uh you know after a very slow start a very slow start uh this game really picks up and it's like it's really super fun uh as you as you get into it but you gotta you gotta survive a little bit <laughs> You went beginning. so deep there. Now you just cut down your wrestling thing. So yeah, no, no, no. It's fun, fine. There's not much to get into about trainer. wrestling. Otherwise, other than that, the Royal Rumble pissed a lot of people off. <laughs> uh, made a lot of people mad. Ronda Rousey came back, uh, which was actually like a lot of people were actually more happy about that uh, because yes, it wasn't a surprise, but at least it was someone coming back to the company after some time away. Brock Lesnar winning the Men's Royal Rumble was a surprise to no one after what happened and he's been around. So everyone was kind of mad about that one because obviously he's taking that spot from someone who a full-time person who could very much use that platform. So going into WrestleMania, I don't know. It's a little, it's a little, it's a little rocky, man. Uh, but, but hopefully we will get more clarity tonight on SmackDown because the, the rumor is that uh, Rousey will face Charlotte Flair for the title at WrestleMania and then we'll we'll see if that actually that actually happens. So we'll see the first inklings of that tonight on Spectre. You have fun? Yeah, it was it was fun, man. Got to talk. I got to see Otis. Yay. I was very excited. I didn't get to take a picture with him because I literally walked past him in the lobby. Uh, but yeah, I had great uh, interviews and, and conversations with Liv Morgan and Apollo Cruz, uh, Reggie, Dewdrop. So you can see all of those uh, on the site. All I'm going to say in my re quick little recap is, bro, you got to head over to comicbook.com anime. That Attack on Titan is getting real crazy. I have read the manga. But if you're Ooh. an anime fan, like we're just getting down to it. And I can't wait to see how people just deal from here on out. Because I have like mainstream fans that I didn't even know touched anything anime coming to me this week being like, yo, wow. Attack on Titan. Like, what is going down? What? And I'm like, yeah. So Attack on Titan, it's going down this week's episode. Did some back to the future. Like, things are getting crazy. People's minds are blown. You guys, if you have not read the manga, and I hate to say that. I hate people who say that. But I, in this case, I, I'm saying it in a good way in this case, not pretending. <laughs> okay. um, I can't wait to see the reaction across just mainstream entertainment as Attack on Titan finishes out in anime form. People's minds are going to be so blown. It's crazy. So things are about to get nuts, and people are going to have a hard time, and it's and it's great. I've been relishing. Want to get nuts? Let's get, Let's get nuts. All right. So, <laughs> Demon Slayer. Uh, Demon Slayer's finale is coming up. Um, I wasn't a big fan of them redoing the movie as an extended part of season two. Boring. But the Entertainment District arc has been fire, and people are freaking out. This last kind of like these last penultimate, I think, episode has put a lot of character lives on the line, and Demon Slayer is looking more beautiful and crazy forever. So mainstream anime right now is hot and like attack on titan and, and demon slayer are the top of the game i mean literally they are like owning the anime genre right now and making worldwide sales and records and crazy stuff so if you guys are not into anime like this is a great place to jump in and kind of these are two series that are just they're beyond what you know anime crazy basement heads are into these are <laughs> mainstream things for good reason <laughs> what is with your labels crazy basement heads we've all met them <laughs> we've met people who come out and they're like attack on titan you're watching that that's that's too mainstream for me have you ever heard and then it's just like oh, oh my boy. god please do that voice more that, no. that's the voice that needs to happen more. So, no, also uh, this is for uh cunning linguists there you go otis oh yeah please don't say that again <laughs> oh please yeah Please do not use that username verbally on this show. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry, CBS Viacom. Or Viacom CBS. Uh, all right, so that's it for anime. Come on, let's get through comics because we got a fun interview to get to. <sighs> all right, so uh, let's move uh, to Lives of Wolverine. 
number two, 10 lives of Wolverine. We'll settle. Did we settle on 10 or X? We're just going <laughs> go 10, 10. We're going 10 we're lives. Go 10. Yeah. 10 lives of Wolverine. Uh, number two, we talked about this before. Now, I know uh, when I was gone, uh, you guys talked about deaths of, of Wolverine. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And so now we're just like, this, this really feels, you know, kind of like you, you do need to read both books <laughs> like as they go. Uh, it's very much kind of a, a weaving thing. But here, um, there's a couple things that present themselves. One, uh, Beast is still horrible and doing things to people that he doesn't need to do. Because <laughs> I feel like his whole thing with Omega Red is like another example of just doing things. Two, Wolverine is starting to go off script. And yes, he's supposed to save Xavier at various points um, in time. But then he's also struggling. And like one of the best things about this actually was like um, when they go back to uh, his days with like Maverick and Sabretooth. And he's talking to Gene about, OK, I know what happens here after this moment. And like yeah. this whole village gets slaughtered and things like that. And then like, I got to fix that. And, and she's, I, she's like, they, I don't know what it is when the way they Wolverine's write Gene. Going full Moira. He's going yeah, full Moira. I don't know what it is when they write Gene, but there's like, there's not like a real like empathetic tone to that with, with Gene a lot. And I don't know what it is, but like, I would assume she would understand. You know what I mean? Like is, the way she comes off kind of sometimes. Uh, Gene's always a good student. She's always like, follow the rule student until she freaks out and that's why she, she oh, yeah out. so then he's like you're the, not the one that has to live with that no. i am i have to live with that regret. so like that's the stuff in here that's really interesting and also the omega red like seeing how he came to learn about this and, and seeing his defection and everything that stuff's really interesting so i mean i came away again this is not the book that i expected to just love i didn't really know what to expect when i came into this uh but i've been really enjoying the ride so far it's been fun yeah, I mean, he having a Cerebro sword, how they've woven all this together, and it can be dense to unravel if you really start to dig deep into it, but like how they've subtly woven this all together with tying Wolverine and Moira together in House of X and, and Powers of Ten, and, and seeing the connection between them, and now coming back to that so that Wolverine's essentially using Moira's power in this kind of weird way to kind of affect the timeline. Omega Red, the Cerebro Sword, all these little pieces that were sprinkled through the Donna X books and now coming together and him using the Cerebro Sword information to track Xavier and do all this stuff and affecting the timeline in this way is is kind of real interesting. So um, I'm still digging this book. I, I want to see how 10 deaths kind of really does converge with it. Um, that's I'm still waiting to see that. But even on its own, 10 lives of Wolverine just out on its own as a series would be interesting to me because seeing him go back and like affect the timeline in his own life and try to write these wrongs and stuff is yeah. kind of interesting. Janelle? Yeah, I, I loved that aspect of it. Like that is really, really cool. I still don't really understand what the big picture of this is. I'm kind of like, what is going on? Can I just say that every comic book this week, I was like, what the bleep am I, what is this? Like, what the bleep am I reading? Because I, <laughs> I'm so just like, there have been moments in every single one that I'm just like, what? <laughs> like, but you finally are a comic reader, Janelle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was very confused and kind of like taken aback several times. But I do, I, I the art was really cool in this. And um, it was like fast paced and exciting. And I love, you know, but I'm kind of understanding what he's doing and these other lives. And I, I still don't know how it's going with the deaths yet but i feel like it will i don't know i feel like i should probably need a little bit more context but i'll get there <laughs> i'm just gonna truck right. truck along <laughs> yeah. next up next up is uh oh this is kofi's bread and butter star wars crimson rain number two T kofi take it away yeah i'm just gonna do a, i'm gonna go through this quick because we got some a lot to get to but uh crimson rain is still this part of this kind of crimson dawn trilogy that the star wars comic writers are unfolding uh, this is the middle section, and this is all about how Lady Kira, before Return of the Jedi, began to position Crimson Dawn as a way to help defeat Palpatine, help bring down the Empire, and presumably plan for what would come afterwards. The only reason I'm really plugging K Crimson uh, Reign number two is because it's kind of this nice isolated story about how Kira manipulates two powerful assassins to go do these jobs that will kind of help Crimson Dawn. One of them, she sends Uchi, you know, Darth Vader's little henchman 
uh, to complete this mission to poison some the Crimson Guard, which is this awesome scene where Palpatine sees his whole Crimson Guard kind of die. Uh, that's awesome. But she also kidnaps a, a, a young, the other assassin, kidnaps a young girl named Cadelia and brings her back to Kira. Now, it's kind of interesting because Cadelia, and you can read my whole tinfoil hat piece on this on comicbook.com, Star Wars is maybe a cover for Omega, this character that was uh, re- um, introduced in the Star Wars Bad Batch animated series last year. Mm-hmm. And Omega is Jango Fett's other natural clone, a female one. So she's Boba Fett's essentially sister. Now, a lot of theory has pointed to a twist in the book of Boba Fett, the finale being the reveal that Crimson Dawn is behind what's happening on Tatooine, is backing the Pike Syndicate, and Kira is behind all this. And this comic coming out the same week as Book of Boba Fett and on the same day, um, kind of just interesting that it kind of sets up that this finale now has all the canon groundwork. Oh, I'm knocking down my set. All has the, <laughs> getting too animated over here. Uh, that this series now has the canon groundwork to basically introduce Kira and maybe Boba Fett's sister as villains behind or, or or just the opposition the ops to all this in book of boba fett so that would lead to some exciting new things there's been rumors that there could be a crimson dawn series there's all this other stuff that they could lead to but uh keep your eyes on star wars comics all right now to the yeah, next what the wtf that matt made us all do monkey king <laughs> prince it's not even a king it's monkey prince okay but here's the thing what yes, is he the prince of the monkey king <laughs> the monkey prince number one um this this actually uh this character and like the premise and everything actually i don't know you... about the i don't know the optics we just put that over my face i don't know the optics of that i don't know if we're oh my to do god like so that. the premise the, the book the premise uh was actually introduced uh, a couple of months ago um i believe or, or like mid last year they did a collection of stories uh and this Kind of, they kind of did a little bit of a, a prologue or an introduction to the character. But here is actually like the proper full origin intro of seeing this young boy kind of uh, discover what his lineage actually is and like that he is actually the uh, heir uh, to the Monkey King and like these powers and all these things. So we're starting to come into that. Here's the thing. I was curious to see what this would do with y'all because I had already read that like intro story and so i already like i knew who shifu pigsy was right and i was actually very excited right i i knew these that this was ridiculous and i was very like it's over the top and i, and I kind of love it um i also love the the creative team on it so i was very curious to see like i already knew what, what this was going in by the way i don't think this issue as a whole is as strong as that previous introduction i actually think i would probably give that to someone and go here's a giving you an idea of who this is and if you'll like it over this issue i didn't think this issue was like the best introduction to this world because you barely get a little bit of it you get it right at the end and some of the other stuff is just kind of i don't know i never like fully bought into i never really fully bought into it but i think the premise overall i think once we get rolling the fun will start to begin. but I So I'm more curious about what you guys think than, than me. I think we're going to move on, and I'm going to say <laughs> that, you know, clearly Matt gets away with his agenda on this show quite often. I've had to read it was Reptile, number one. Boy, Reptile Boy, Now This, and Stop It. Okay, whoa, whoa. Let's, we're gonna Reptile get to the, was fun. That was a good get book. To the, let's get to the things that should have won in this place. Janelle, I can't speak for Janelle Wheeler, though. What? Oh, Monkey Prince? Uh, I was feeling it. I was like, okay, this is cool. I'm learning a new character. This is super interesting. And then, like, the very last thing, I was like, what the bleep did I just watch? Like, what is it? What did I just read? (laughs) I liked it. I thought it was fun. It was bright and colorful. And I fun. apologize it for was, my co-host. It, I liked it more than than Wolverine. You know, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I, I apologize yeah. for it's my ridiculous. co-host. It's this ridiculous. Show gets off the rails. Kobe doesn't sometimes. like fun. Anyway, so the <laughs> it's winner, ridiculous. It's, it's ridiculous. It's fun. It's a talking <laughs> pig. Anyway, it is. Right. it's cute though. Uh, so Dark Knights of Steel number four was the pool winner <laughs> this week. Thank you, everybody. Um, oh, I love that choice. Yeah, that was um, a really good one. Yes, back to some. And I was very, I was honestly stuff. very surprised because there was actually some good competition this week. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, that this one won, and this just moves us into we finally get the origin story um, of how uh, 
you know, Clark's family and came to rule and how the Waynes, like all that, that backstory, that rich backstory that, that Taylor's so good at yeah. uh, is woven in, in this issue. And we, it's all from the view of Alfred and we see his place and, and how he came into be like, there's just so much really great uh, character stuff here. Also, we get the big reveal um, spoilers. Obviously I'm going to, touch on this one i guess this would be a big spoiler uh we get the the reveal of who the green man is who has been talked about in the last few issues but we never really quite know we assumed it was a green lantern uh it is kind of <laughs> a, green, a green lantern uh, but it's the joker uh version the joker of this world it's um, lex luther and the lex joker. luther yeah. and the joker who has a kryptonite green lantern ring it's insane. right <laughs> pretty that's pretty it's cool the coolest mashup. yeah tom cool taylor is awesome at this at that stuff um so yeah so that just seeing that and that he was the reason like why they had to reveal themselves to the waynes and to the kingdom anyway but then also he was the reason why they died like there's a lot woven into this issue so if you've been a fan of the series i think this is a great issue but what you guys yeah uh, um i think i said it before and i'm just going to maintain that tom taylor does such a good job with these that like deceased and this deserve to be their own universes like there he does such strong world building that like i would follow this medieval dc universe for more adventures than this yeah, but this too. one was and then this one hit home i mean this was like great because it was the batman tragedy but also, this really kind of like weirdly deep new age story about like <laughs> couples and relationships. That was my what the bleep moment. I was like, wait, yeah. what? Like, no, is I mean, this they, like I mean, a they soap formed, opera? They, like... they formed a nice little polycule. The Waynes and the the Waynes and the L's formed a nice little that. polycule. I love how they, they're like, they had it's a nice all little, good, though. Yeah, they're they had a four way couple going. They were they got they were over like, it yeah. and they became yeah. best friends. I'm like, lies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, hey, so times are changing. Times, times are changing, Janelle. These are these it's, are new. It's going to become a stories. TLC yeah. show soon. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. so it's fine. exactly. So, like, yeah. So this is what we're into now. So, but I mean, but it is. But it was a good adult story. Like, it's about these couples mm -hmm. who had to work through this like really kind of messed up thing and kind of actually. And you believe that they're like friends when like Martha's dying and she brings Lara over and she's like, look, like you know, here's the deal. <laughs> Like, I need you to do this. I need you to raise Bruce. Like, and I need, and like that stuff, like, was pretty crazy. Like, and so, mm -hmm. I mean, that's probably the best joint origin I've seen of Batman and Superman together that I'm probably going to get. So, yeah, weird yeah. polycule thing thrown in, but hey, you know, there we are. Yeah, Speaking that, of weird, that last Alfred line, too, just. <laughs> on the uh, who, like when he says i have a king oh, oh that's mm. so good that was such a movie moment too that's such a cinematic moment some people um, are asking me if asking polycule yeah hey we educate on this show you oh, guys got we, we send you to the googles never I'm for not, good reasons <laughs> now kofi put this one in so i'm gonna let him run with this one. yeah i mean good. speaking of weird getting weird i'm just gonna say i've seen marvel do some weird stuff with saber tooth over the years we've all seen marvel do some weird stuff with reinventing saber tooth man I was not expecting what I got in Sabretooth number one. But uh, yeah, Sabretooth runs mutant hell now. So there you go. I I just love that they, they this is one of those things when it happened, when they when they put him down there, you were always like, you, you've always wondered and they've and they've brought it up and mentioned it, it several times, right? Of like when they're debating things. And so I was just always hoping that they would take a minute, whether it was in another series. I didn't expect them to do his own, but. I, even just for another series, I was always hoping that they would explore that. What is that down there? How does that work? You know, are there tears and things like that? And then this book comes out and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm God, okay. Yeah, I, I totally, that, that makes total sense. And and I'm in. I just love that they're taking chances with, with some of their characters, you know. So while I don't feel like the core, um, like we don't have a book right now that I feel like is doing the house and powers thing that is like this main through book. Cause like Inferno is over now. Right. So until the next kind of event, we don't really have that core book that's doing that. And then lately it feels like, Oh, lives and deaths. Wolverine is, is doing that. Sabretooth is doing that. You're getting that storytelling just in other parts of the X-Men. Well, thing. I like how they're building things out and giving counterparts like, yeah. Wolverine's a good counterpart to Moira, and now Sabretooth is like this counterpart because we got like the Nightcrawler series 
that was yep. all about like the religion and mutant church and all that. Right. And it's like, well, now we have mutant hell. And I just, I just love the premise that you can't put Saber Tooth anywhere. You put him into the ground, and it's just him and his mind down there. And what does he do? He becomes even worse Saber Tooth. Like, yeah, you know, pretty much. That's how exponentially that's how and just murders everybody. In the fantasies of him just like murdering everybody, <laughs> it's crazy. So that was a WTF for that one. Um, all right. So finally. We're going to wrap things up uh, there. I'm going to let after this because we're about to get into our interview. But I just want to mention Star Wars. The High Republic is still going strong. One of our favorite kind of franchises to cover on the show. Uh, we had a new High Republic issue of the comic come out this week. That's very tied to the new novel uh, and showed kind of, you know, the takedown of the Nihil leader, Lorna D, and how that ties to the Starlight Beacon and all this stuff. That's really great in this expanding kind of franchise that's going on across mediums. We had another High Republic Trail of Shadows issue, which is kind of the miniseries about two Jedi detectives, Jedi, Je Jedi's as the tw detective noir. Not bad. And building these new force eating monsters that are out there, the levelers. And that issue was written by our interview guest, who also not only has that comic coming out this week, but has the High Republic new young adult novel, Midnight Horizon, coming out or is out right now. Um, Daniel Jose Older will be joining us in just a second to talk about all things in Star Wars, The High Republic. But uh, that'll be the end for our regular show. We're going to say goodbye to Matt and Janelle before I hop over to my interview with uh, Daniel Jose Older. So uh, thanks, guys. But uh, your services are no longer needed. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks this for week. hanging with us. This Deuces. is great. This is awesome uh, show. All right, and so we will go in. Rich is in the background, Star Wars fan slash producer of the show, Rich. Let's go talk to Mr. Daniel Jose Older. Hey, Comic Book Nation, it's me, Kofi Outlaw, and today I am happy to sit down with one of the writers of Star Wars, The High Republic, one of our favorite lines to cover on the show. Mr. Daniel Jose Older is with us. Yes, and indeed. in addition to the many things you have written you've written some great current high republic lines star wars the high republic adventures comic book star wars trail of shadows comic mini series and the new novel the thing we are here to talk about the most star wars the high republic midnight horizon so daniel thank you for joining us on comic book nation today thanks for having me it's really great to be here so I was going to get into my first question, but I realized as I was getting into it that there was a technical question I've been dying to ask. Um, <laughs> it's kind of become noticeable that the High Republic line and the way that it's organized, you know, you have these adult novels, YA novels, you know, mid-grade novels and so forth in the comics. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like there's a rotation amongst the writing team of who gets to do the quote unquote, for lack of a better term, the main chapters of the storyline in each wave. You know, you had Charles write Light of the Jedi. Then we spoke to Kevin last year when he did The Rising Storm and Claudia just did The Fallen Star. So my first question for you is, is there a rotation and are you on deck to also do one of these main chapters of the line? I'm glad you asked that because that, that allows me to dispel a common <laughs> misunderstanding about how it all works. I have zero interest in doing a Del Rey <laughs> adult novel. Um, and and they, they and there's certain ways in which they do cover like the, some of the major like galactic narrative moments that are happening for sure. Um, but one thing I love about the initiative is how much we've been able to spread out like major plot lines and major stories throughout the, you know, even especially I think to have them in a line like Higher Public Adventures, like to have so much of like the early um, versions, not versions, the early um, narrative beats of Marquion Rowe happen in Adventures. Uh -huh. Sorry for my dogs. Um, you know, there's so many cool and really relevant to the larger story plot lines and, and threads that get pulled throughout all the different work. And that's a rarity, you know, I think, and in, in not just in Star Wars, but in a lot of IP, they tend to kind of really focus in the major franchises. The, the major, major things are only in like these particular tentpole moments so to have it so spread out is really cool that's one thing the other thing is there's so much the other if you if you're paying attention and you are you will just see there's so much work like great opportunities to do great different kinds of work across age groups across mediums in this initiative so what that means and there's five of us right and so what that means is that if you see someone doing something it's because we love it and if you see someone not doing something, it's probably because we don't actually want to do it. <laughs> that's that's a that's a safe assumption to make. 
I love the Del Rays and I love that I'm not the one right at the Del Rays because it's just not for me. Um, so no. <laughs> okay. All right. I mean, as long as the job satisfaction is there, that's, I think that's what. Oh yeah. I, I'm very happy. Important. All right. Yeah. So that, that's a great opener to this next question, which is you have worked with the Padawan characters of the high Republic and their journey and when they're going, but you've also worked with adult star Wars characters. You're also doing trail of shadows, which is in some ways very much kind of like an adult noir uh, the in the Star Wars. Yeah. <laughs> so for you, which one is a harder story to tell within the star Wars framework, uh, the coming of age hmm. kind of tale or the adult drama? Um, I don't think there's a clear answer to that for me. They're both, you know, they both have their challenges and they're very different challenges for sure because they are such different stories. I'm more just kind of excited by the cool challenge of having the opportunity, I guess, of, of being able to display such a range of storytelling. You know, like, it's so cool that, that these two comics will both come out in the same month and it'll be one where it's like hugs and pastries and the other where it's like monsters and hallucinations and, you know, evil singing nursemaids and everything. And um, th that's, you know, that's range. And it's a range that I, I um, have in my, in the material that I consume too. You know, I love Avatar The Last Airbender and I love, you know, The Godfather and Alien and like all those different other pieces that Narcos. Um, and so all those different influences, like, you know, when you're an artist, you take in things and you put things back out into the world, sometimes based on what you take in. And so it's a really cool opportunity to get to like put all those influences into and inspirations into play um, across the board in the same story. And that's what's really fun too, is to have those little tiny crossover moments, you know, like when we were doing the Jedi Rumble race and we get to see some of the characters from Channel Shadows and back and forth, you know. So it, to me, it's just great. It's just fun to be in conversation with myself as well as being in conversation with the wider initiative. Looking at your latest novel, Midnight Horizon, from the title to the kind of character arcs, there is this theme that seems to take shape about how we face, you know, challenging or scary times that are coming or maybe here even faster than we thought. I had to ask after, while I was reading the book, I had to just know, was this always how this chapter of the High Republic took shape or was this based on things that have like happened in the world in the last couple of years? Did that make you guys go back to the drawing board and be like, we got to update, you know, what kids are going through and facing, and, you know, really take on some of this because it seems so timely. It, it does. And uh, that is quite honestly just the way it played out. We didn't uh, we didn't change anything. I think, you know, I think while we were all writing, it became more poignant. So it's possible on the micro level, like we, we it, the things changed subconsciously or consciously um as we were going but you know the truth is kids unfortunately are always going through really really hard things i think what's happened now is that that collectively like on a global scale it is a very difficult time for particularly for young people whereas before the pandemic it was just um like very specific segments of society that were going through you know regular horrible times and you know now you know we all it's been distributed <laughs> unevenly of course because it is an uneven distribution system across the board so you know i, I always think about that in terms of, of my audience um i'm always writing to the kid that's going through it and and i also am writing aware that the kid that's going through it isn't defined by going through it, right like kids who are going through it also have joy and fall in love and have everyday things going on and deal with lots of of worldly problems both are true right and that's well, that's one balance i really wanted to strike going into this and, and every time i write a young young adult fiction is to let the kids be kids but also have the kids have to grow up to some level because that's what ultimately that's what every ya is about is about stepping into adulthood actively somehow and sometimes feeling like you're forced to do it but then actually taking the step to do it so that you can win you know is like that's what's always going on and we see that across the board for all the characters and that, that's really what I set out to do. You mentioned one of the key words here that kind of has stuck with me since reading the book, which is, of course, balance. That word is so important to Star Wars is this idea of balance. Um, what I kind of love, and you talked about the connectivity of the line and getting to kind of everybody, getting to kind of share in moments, even if it's not in, in different places down the line. Right now, kind of across the line where we got into this kind of pivotal, no spoilers, but we got into pivotal turning point in the High Republic and the Jedi and what they're facing. 
And it seems like across the line, if you're keeping track of the whole thing, quite a few, we're seeing quite a few Jedi characters begin to step out of balance to mm -hmm. kind of have these moments, both the adult Jedi and the Padawans that, you know, we're always paranoid looking out for if our Jedi are beginning to take that downward slide into mm -hmm. some of the darker places, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can you tease us about how that process is going to kind of come into play for these Padawan characters after the kind of drastic events of the of this book and its kind of cousin novel from Claudia Gray, The Fallen Star? Uh, nothing, because <laughs> that would be a spoiler. But it's a great question. And, and I will say that, like, that's one of the cool things about it. We've talked a lot of, uh, throughout this initiative, especially in the, in the launch of it, about how different Jedi understand the Force, right? Because we have this amazing opportunity to really see different Jedi dealing with the Force in different ways because it's it was initially a time of peace, you know, when we met them. Now it's a time of war. And now we get to and have to understand and see the Jedi, all those different versions of the Force that they understand also are manifested through trauma, right? So I think we see them all dealing with the trauma of war in very real ways. Um, including the Padawans, because the Padawans are also in the war and on the front lines and, and dealing with it in very real ways. So that's manifested through the force. What I think is cool is that there, there are definitely dark side moments and teases, you know, throughout the initiative in different ways. And I think that's always on people's mind correctly. What's also cool is that there's also this whole range of emotions that are, yes, a pathway to the dark side, but also in their own right, just hard to deal with, you know, and, and even in, and that was something I really uh, wanted to look at in this book, whether it's with Comac or Ram or lots of different folks who are just going through it, that they are having a lot of emotions and they are also very powerful force users. And what does that look like? You know, what does that mean outside of like where it'll lead to or slippery slope, but just in the right now, in the here and now, like how do they manage their emotions? And a lot of the answer to that is through community and through friendship and this, you know, really blessed union of Jedi and what they can do for each other and be there for each other in different ways. That's why there's so many friendships in this book. And that that's really the heart of the book is everyone's connectivity and relationships to each other. Wow, that's a great answer. Thanks. Without spoiling anything you were hand you've been handed kind of one of the most monumental tasks of this line which is handling the character of of yoda yeah i'm gonna tweak this question around a little bit just sure. to keep it nice and clean mm -hmm. for all mm -hmm. our people who are getting into high republic mm -hmm. but what are the general challenges and now at this point in the line are the challenges of handling Yoda's story in a way that is kind of still fresh for fans to learn about this character, but also kind of reflects some of the inevitability of where we know this storyline ends sure, up. Sure, it, and that is exactly the challenge, right? Like when you have a monumental character, what you can't do is treat them like a monument. And that's always the danger, right? First of all, they cast a long shadow. Second of all, especially a character like Yoda, the danger is also them becoming just a dogmatic kind of like, you know, priest or whatever, who's just like spitting out like force fortune cookies, which is not good writing and not fun. Um, and not a real, doesn't feel like a fleshed out character, right? And that's why particularly like, there's a whole group of flashback scenes in um, Midnight Horizon, which was a way to get Yoda into the story throughout. And that was really an opportunity for me to also have Yoda actually emote some and go through it a little bit, um, both with his Padawan who is going through a kind of Padawan life crisis and and then also to be challenged with the half a bore situation. <laughs> Which is probably, I was gonna say, one of the most Yoda moments in all of Yodadom <laughs> that I've ever read or, or just experienced as a Star Thank Wars you. fan as a scene. I was just like, oh yeah, this is like classic Yoda. Classic. Like, yeah, classic, classic Yoda. Yoda. Like, yeah, very much was, so. That was very simple. Like I, I needed a moment to echo later, first of all. And then I needed a moment. I just really wanted a moment that was just Yoda. Like what you said, pure Yoda. And I also wanted to show a very sort of like a, essentially and initially very basic like household situation go way out of hand. <laughs> like just take a left and completely overwhelm even Yoda. Because let's be honest, like that's what it's like. You can have your, are we swearing on this? 
a little bit. We keep it PG. You can have your crap together on every yeah. level and really have it together. And you can still just like, you know, get completely overwhelmed by basic household crap. <laughs> and like, that was, that was what I was trying to build towards. That's why there's so many baby half of boards popping out. <laughs> yeah. And not to get too deep cut, but I love how, what's so great is just a reflection of how Yoda reacts to all this. And it's just kind of, He's like, always okay. still chill. And then when right. something surprising happens, he's like, ah, the forest. And he's all happy about it. And like, <laughs> it's like, oh, another one. Oh, dear. Oh, that's happening? Oh, let me just. Uh... <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there were some uh, great things. I came away. I mean, I know you said you didn't want the fortune cookie at all, but I came away feeling like I had read some really great fortune cookies out of all of this. Well, I didn't say I don't want wisdom in the book. Okay. <laughs> I said, that fair, can't be, fair enough. Right. It can't right. be all canned, like you know, just things they spit out and that's all yeah. they are, right? You have to kind of, to me, wisdom moments are like action moments. You have to earn them, right? Like you have to earn them by having flesh and blood characters participate, right? If we have a huge, that whole battle piece at the end, that's huge, right? But if we hadn't worked our way there piece by piece to care about those characters, it wouldn't have mattered. It just would have been people blowing each other up. And the same is true with, with wisdom, right? Like we care more about the things said because we care about the people saying them and the people they're being said to. That's what really makes them land. Well, the whole Yoda and uh, Cantum thing really got me in the dad feel. So uh, well done. Me too. And uh, I was just in, on the way to becoming a dad when I wrote. Oh yeah, I'm. I'm just. I got. To, I got toddlers right now, and it's just like yeah, that whole thing. I don't even want to think about. But I had to think about you know the days of letting go. I was like, oh man, this is too serious. Sure. I gotta get out of here. But sure. uh, let's get back on topic. This is not yeah. my show. Um, I have to ask you as a kind of follow up to everything you just said about mm -hmm. Yoda. Uh, when we talked to Kevin Scott, this was about a year ago. Mm -hmm. He kind of made it clear that what you guys are doing with the High Republic has no kind of connective threads. That the Acolyte TV show is its own thing. Mm -hmm. Is that still true? And how do you guys pull that off when there is something like Yoda as a potential connective thread that would be between both sides of this? I don't know. I, I honestly just don't think about it because I don't know about I don't know anything about it. So I just, you know, I, I know that if I step on something that's, that they need for later, I'm going to get a note about it and I'll make the change. So other than that, I, that, that, what that means is I don't have to think about it, which is great. We're still you know, a, a different, we're the same era, but we're a little ways away in that chronology, I think, far enough away to kind of be able to not step on each other's feet, which was the idea. 200 years gives you some, uh, some uh, like, yeah. Or, yeah, gives you some breathing room, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so that still holds true. So yeah. let's move on. Um, so we have these in the kind of latest waves of the high republic we have a new element that's been introduced which are called which we refer to now as the levelers which are these kind of uh for better lack of term force consuming entities that are always on the peripherals of these stories and doing some pretty horrible things to our jedi characters mm -hmm. what i wanted to ask you is not for spoilers but just the kind of the logic of how this is being rolled out is there a specific reason for keeping the reveal of the appearance or design of these creatures a secret? Um, I think it's so you could think of it like alien, you know, like you, you, you know, you take your time, right? You don't throw the monster onto the page in the first panel, right? Like when the first shot, like you kind of work your way towards it. And I think what their effect is, is the most important thing. And sort of knowing that as we move towards finding more about them. And we do find out more about it. In fact, if you saw the preview pages for Trail of Shadows that dropped yesterday for the issue that drops on Wednesday, what day is it? Today's it Thursday. is Thursday. Next, next Wednesday. Um, there's a lot of information there because they're really starting to close in on, that's that whole investigation is leading them towards that creature and they're really starting to uh, get to it. So we're finding out more as we go, but it is like, finding it's, out more is a lot of what people are after and that's... Uh, you know. I think in the latest issue I just read, they were in a cargo bay and they encountered one of them. Mm -hmm. yes. So, and we got images and I wanted to ask you, the image that was drawn there was that, that those are all just the projections and the Correct. Jedi's. Okay, so that's one to clarify that. That's right. Are they evil Yodas? You can tell me now. Just you know, <laughs> are they going to be like evil Yodas? There's going to be like a whole Yoda war. It's actually it's Yaddle. Is that? It's just, it's just a Yaddle clone running around. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd be down for that. Yoda wars. I'm I'm all about that. But um, all right, but we'll see because we'll take this Ooh. alien journey because it is freaking me out. We're getting dusted Jedi. Good, then we're doing our jobs. So one last thing, and now we're just going to get, I'm just getting kind of deep cut. This is me with my tinfoil sure. hat. Um, so Charles did a recent issue of the Star Wars comic series, and mm -hmm. it was this very interesting kind of moment where 
Luke goes to a virgins in the force, which takes him to a vision, which takes him to meet an echo of Elzar Man, one of our High Republic characters. Mm -hmm. And he gets to see a vision of the Republic. And mm -hmm. we got this not so coincidental name drop of Darth Bane for, I believe, the first time in canon that somebody references him by name and that these events with Darth Bane happen, which, of mm -hmm. course, Fran, fans were freaking out about because this is the old Republic, something a lot of fans have you know loved from now what we call the legends universe but always want to see in canon do you have or the team have any kind of past baton because when it was high republic time in the comics we started noticing these little blips you know little uh messages of holocrons of avar started showing up other mentions started showing up mm -hmm. is there a kind of duty to pass the baton even further back amongst the high republic team to get that baton back to the old republic <laughs> <laughs> is it so the sipping your tea is just is that all we're getting from you <laughs> no comment no comment okay i'll take no comment as, as that was an actual no comment <laughs> no i know i take it as a no comment as a no comment but no comment I'm just is because better. i just literally can't comment <laughs> yeah no i mean that's better than stop dreaming kid it's better that's a better answer than that um all right, so that was that was it for my main questions. I'm just trying to think if there's anything. I think I've thrown all all my potential big twists at you, but uh, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, let's take a minute to promote. We were promoting Midnight Horizon, which is out. Everybody go pick that up. Pick up uh, the IDW comics that you work on are great uh, for the Padawan stories. Trail of Shadows is great. Is there anything else upcoming that you wanted to plug from the line or from your for yourself before uh, before we say? Um, I'm doing the upcoming graphic novel once we get to phase two. That's a little ways down the road. Um, but yes, my next novel, my next young adult novel is called Ballad and Dagger. And it comes out in May. It's from Rick Riordan's imprint, which is also Disney. Um, and I'm really excited about it. If you like my work in Star Wars, if you like Star Wars, you will definitely love this book. Although it is a urban fantasy set in Brooklyn with demons and gods and monsters and other types of things. Uh, so Ballad and Dagger, it's the first book of a series called Outlaw Saints. There are also pirates and love. I support anything named Outlaw. Uh, one last thing I did, I, I mean, I got I have you here and I will yeah. not be doing my job if I didn't get you to weigh in on something completely different. Okay. Do you think the book of Boba Fett is spending enough time with Boba Fett? <laughs> I will say this, and I'm not just being diplomatic. I love it. <laughs> That's all I got to say. It's great. I love, I've loved every episode. Um, I'm a Return of the Jedi fan, first and foremost. That was my introduction to Star Wars. And I'm also a Roberto Rodriguez fan from back in the mariachi and desperado days. So it's all my favorite things coming together in one place. Okay, man, that is the ultimate diplomatic answer. This you're like a Jedi master. I Thank you diplomat. very much, Daniel Jose Alder, for joining us on Comic Book Nation. Congratulations on all your work, Star Wars and beyond. And uh, everybody, check out Midnight Horizon, great new Star Wars uh, High Republic novel. Check that out now and check out the whole line because we keep telling you guys it's amazing. The deeper you get, the better it gets. So, uh, jump in now. I agree. Also, not being diplomatic, it's really good work. Like, I feel really privileged to work on a team with such amazing writers. I love reading it. Like, it's my homework to read these great books and comics so that I'm up to date. And it's just pure pleasure for me. I'm angling the camera this way so you don't see my wall with string theories about everything that's happening across <laughs> all Star Wars and High Republic intersections right now. But uh, yeah, it's so much fun. Thank Actually, behind so me, this, this is the remnant of what was the entire phase one mapped out on the wall behind me. But I had to take it down because yeah. of spoilers. Yeah. Tra <laughs> also a trail of secrets over here. All right. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. Right, thank, Holder. You. thank you very much. Uh, take care. Take care of yourself. All right. I botched the landing on mute. <laughs> thank you to everyone for, and thank you for Daniel Jose Older for stopping by Comic Book Nation. Check out the entire Star Wars The High Republic line that's available in books, in comics, different levels from young adult to adult. 
check that all out and uh, check out comic book nation. We are live every Friday on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. If you just want to listen to the audio version, we are on your favorite podcast platforms, including Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or tell any smart home device to play comic book nation podcast. I want to thank my co-host Janelle Wheeler and Matthew Aguilar for always being here and we'll catch you guys next week. Peace. <laughs>